Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are now ready to go into our panel session. This is a, a great opportunity to get involved. I, we're all warmed up with some good questions in the last session, so just encourage you really to, to get involved, to ask questions. This is our opportunity to really dive deep into the subject of uh, change. I'm going to hand over to Heidi Fraser-Kraus from the University of York. You may remember her from such uh, exciting presentations as yesterday's role-playing extravaganza. So hopes are high, and I'll hand over to Heidi, and she can introduce the rest of our panel. No role-playing this time, I promise. Okie doke, so a very warm welcome. Um, on our panel here, in no particular order, we have Emma from the University of Leeds, we have Rachel from the University of Lancaster, we have Carla from the Service Desk Institute, and we have John from Manchester College. Uh, most of these people are already known to you. Poor Rachel has been strong-armed into sitting on this panel because her boss made a mistake. Just getting that out for the record. <laughs> Okie doke. So we're here to talk about change. And as you know, the um, theme of the conference was change is the only constant. And I thought that was a bit of a sort of kitschy phrase. But then I googled it. So this is actually a misquote of, and I'm going to be careful how I pronounce this. I know, take a deep breath because I could get this really wrong and it would be dead rude. <laughs> right. Heraclitius. See? <laughs> I'll spell it. H-E-R-A-C-L-I-T-U-S. Right. He was an ancient Greek philosopher and he actually said, the only thing that is constant is change. And he said that in 500 BC. And the reason I wanted to tell you that was because I think that this problem of change is one that we've been struggling with for an extremely long time, so it's not new. And part of that made me think, why is it such a big problem? Um, I haven't got an answer to that, I just know that it's a problem that we've had for a long time. So, we're now going to have a panel discussion on the topic of change, and I know that your very organised uh, conference chair had already gathered some questions from the floor. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put two questions to the whole panel and um, give them the opportunity to answer. My mic's gone. Is it on? Okay. Um, and then we'll get in some comments from the floor. So, the first question <coughs> which came in is this. I'll read it out. Change needs to be supported by up-to-date knowledge, skills and modern best practice. A team or organisation that is unaware of a widening skills gap or where the learning curve has become too steep, can find it difficult to embrace the necessary change, especially when that change must be self-motivated. What can be done to better empower, inspire, and motivate a team to organize in this situation? Now, that's a hard question. So, who'd like to start? <laughs> start that under the table. John? First of all, I think the core of that question really comes down to how you run your organisation. And if you run your organisation as a village, as a family, as a community, then those things start to go away quite quickly. Um, first thing I did when I got into this current role was try to get everybody who belonged to the department into one space, because they were all over the place, and get them all in a room so they actually didn't send kind of dodgy emails to each other and started talking to each other. It's amazing how many peaceful moments you can have over coffee when you have to share the kettle. So you get to people to talk together, spend time together, and instead of sending an email to someone, they can sort of just pop their head up and go, uh, Andy, could you just put a call on for me for this, that, and the other? And then you start to have a totally different attitude amongst people, that they start to work together, and then you start to have a place where you can investigate change. Certainly, change can sometimes feel like, I feel like I'm the guy with training shoes on chasing a bloke on a snowmobile, and he's off into the distance, and I'm the person who's got to try and keep up. Whereas if I actually think that we're all together in this, then we're all walking together in this, 
then we actually do the change together. And we've got to be all embraced in the change. And that means I want to hear what's going on. I want to hear other people discussing the changes that are about to impact me. I want to hear about what's going on. And if we can, in a community, in a group, in a village, start sharing information and discussing it openly and having it as an open way of describing each other's worlds, then everybody starts to get involved. And once everybody's involved, then you can start to look for the future and start to invent and create and innovate in ways you never thought of. I don't think change is something that's present. It's just an absence of stability. And as long as we admit that stability is not something to hold on to, and that actually stability is something to dump and get rid of, we should be thoroughly throwing ourselves into going forwards. And that means change is every day. That's what I'd say. Great, thank you. So, Rachel was scribbling away. I was scribbling away. I was scribbling away a bit earlier, actually. And I was actually looking at the idea of um, addressing skills gaps and taking whole teams who are kind of are perhaps not where they need to be and um, thinking about how we get that together. And actually recognising that it's a team effort, again, is a really important element. Um, not everybody needs to be an expert in everything within a team. Um, one of the things we're doing at Lancaster is looking at integrated digital capabilities into the curriculum, which um, when you look at the broad areas of different subject areas, different academics, their skills levels, the skills levels of the different students that come on to different programmes, it's kind of like a really huge thing. So straight away we said, well actually, what we need to do is we need to be really clear about the overall goal, why are we doing this, you know, what's the strategic lead on this, using exemplars, um, but actually, then we need to go down and talk to the individual team. So I have a feeling it's going to take us quite a long time to do this. But it's really important to look at a particular discipline, a particular programme, and say, actually, so if you want to assess your students' digital needs within that programme, um, it doesn't have to be in every single module. It doesn't have to be every element of every programme. Every lecturer doesn't have to be doing quizzes online. It doesn't have to be kind of teaching you and assessing you on all of the different bits. It needs to be across the entire programme. So, so it is, it's a team effort within that programme. Um, but at the same time, we want the whole institution to be moving forward together. So um, I think it's also about making it personal, though, as well as having the team. So what is actually going to make a difference to the individual? What's going to make them... There's a bit of, in the question, there's a bit at the end that said, oh, and it's self-motivated. I was thinking, oh, no, <laughs> and they're going to be self-motivated. Well, you have to work out what's motivating them. Um, another thing that we're doing is um, we're digitizing all of our services over the next few years. And the one of the immediate impacts of this is that our ground staff and our cleaners and our kind of a, a lot of the staff in facilities who used to get their pay slips all by paper, they get their communications by paper, they get posters put up in the, the coffee areas, all that kind of thing. Suddenly, um, as we move forward, some of that stuff's going to get wiped away. So, rather than just saying, well, actually, this is how you get your, now get your pay slip online, we're going and talking to them about what skills, actually, what does digital mean to them? You know, do they want to do their shopping online? Do they want to contact their family on Facebook, on, on Skype, or do they want to be on Facebook? What, what is it that they would like to do in their personal life, which then we can translate into, okay, and actually in the workplace, you'll need to use this clever little app to get your payslip and that kind of thing. So, so there's a... I've kind of rambled now, haven't I? Chris will wish that he never signed me up to do this <laughs> But it's about being clear about the goals, making sure it's a team effort, but actually, in terms of motivating people, working out what's the difference for them, and be clear about where you want to get to with skills. So, you know, what is it you're trying to do? Not everybody has to suddenly become massively digital at everything. It's just what are you trying to achieve? So, I, I thank you for that. Yeah, just, um, <laughs> I've also been reflecting on this um, based on my past experience in higher education and more recent experience in the corporate world, um, where change is, is very rapid sometimes. So in the corporate environment, change can feel essential for survival, um, and you have to be very responsive to that. Having spent 20-odd years working in higher education before I went into that environment, change feels much more incremental sometimes, but also the pace of change in higher education is sometimes quite slow. 
And I think that sometimes brings frustrations for staff because one change leads to another change and it feels like it's, it's being done to them. So if I reflect on all of that experience, I think the, the important things for me as a leader in previous roles has been to be the champion of change. I think we all need to very much champion the fact that change is essential for survival and also to improve. And we should lead from the front. We should always lead from the front. Um, and that is partly what Rachel was saying about setting your goals. And it's more than that for me. I think it's about setting the vision and the mission and really always reinforcing, bringing everything back to the reason that we're, that we're here. So for service professionals, that's actually quite easy because the reason that we are here is that we live to serve our customers. And again, the links back to our customers to say, Emma, tell us what, what it's like to be a student in, you know, in this day and age. And encouraging our staff to maintain those links and use that very strong voice to help us improve services is, is absolutely key to, to you know, the excellent service that we want to offer. So for me, we can better support people by making sure that that skills gap is never that wide because we are directly linking to our student population or our, you know, our academic population as well within our education. Okay. Emma, do you want to say anything? Um, no, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any comments from the floor? So what I picked up there was personal contact, really important, getting people speaking to each other, get rid of this idea that stability is a good thing to have, talk to people, understand their needs, make it personal, set goals, and then change is essential for survival, and I think that's very important. Any questions? Comments? Yep. There's a mic coming, sorry. Any other comments, questions? I think it depends on what your problem is. Uh, like if I've lost work, uh, lost all my, say my memory of health, or something, my first point of call would still be to go to the university service desk. But if I'd say dropped my laptop or my iPad or whatever, I'd probably go to the provider of that laptop or iPad. And um, so I think it's all your problems. Like I think I see the IT service desk as a more technological place so say if it's not something I've like broken to my own fault because I feel if I went to Apple or PC World or whatever um, they'd just try and maybe like rip me off or something like that where at least with the IT service desk because I feel like they're there for the students and they want to help the students I've just got a lot more faith in them than big companies Comments from the panel? Um, 
when we do the service desk training in particular, we do focus on the idea that, that the service desk is always, um, if, if, if the service desk can't handle a, a problem and it's not directly about IT, what you need to do is be able to reroute the person to the, the place they need to go. And certainly when you're delivering face-to-face -face support in universities, I think having the friendly, caring face does enable you to uh, facilitate a great relationship with students, which should then lead to you being more knowledgeable about them, but also means that you must be more knowledgeable about all services that are offered by the university. So I always think we should, if we want to be good at our jobs, we need to be Google Maps, we need to be the sat map, we need to know where to route people. And that as service professionals, it's not just about IT, it should be about the whole digital um, way that people engage with, with technology. So I think it's more than just... Uh, yeah, it's broken, so I need to fix it. I think it's much more the sat nav methodology these days for me. Okay, I'm going to bring us back to change again, and I'm going to read out now the second question that was put to the panel. So this is again for the whole panel. When looking at transformational change, often it's the case that things get worse before they get better. How can we communicate this to customers in a positive way while still ensuring we are setting their expectations. Another good question, and a difficult one. Who wants to start on this one? Yes. Ah. Okay, so the first thing I, I think from that is don't, don't assume that you know what the customer wants um, and have a good dialogue with your customer to start with and always be honest about what you are trying to do. So underneath um, transformational change is the intention to improve. That's what we're trying to do. So we can see the end point. So then we should be sharing that journey with the customer right from there. Okay, we are building you a new library. As a result, you know, on campus there will be disruption to your IT. Um, so I think it's about being very honest and inviting comments along the journey to, to transformational change and not just saying this will happen to you at that point, but very much making it a journey that you share with the customer. you talk to the customer so actually plan and start thinking of you can although you don't know what the customer wants sometimes you can anticipate at least who you different state I mean I'm, I'm from comms so I'm bound to say this you need a really good communications plan <laughs> um, you need to actually think about who it's going to impact when it's going to impact them how it's going to impact them then you can start having the conversations with them about what are good times of year you know let's not do this during clearing or let's not do it in exam time or Maybe we don't want to do that kind of discussion um, that you can have with them. So um, it's really just about planning at the beginning, keeping up the communications, not stopping that communication as you're going through as well. So it's not a case of, I've now got a comms plan. This, I see this all the time. I've now got a communications plan. It's marvellous. I'm going to send out this email at this time on this you know, date. As the, you know, everything's a moving feast, you need to have that conversation with the end customer about how it's impacting them and make your adjustments. Um, and also don't assume that you're going to get to everybody just because you send out an email or whatever. You need to actually sit down and have that conversation with those people. So I'd agree with that. John? On a practical level as well, um, when I first arrived in the college, got a call from a very concerned teacher. Exams were struggling. There were dealing with problems every day, they couldn't get through to the exam boards when they were online. So I went along to visit and did my fiddling with the machine and tried to show that I was actually trying to be interested. Over the next few weeks I <laughs> turned up at executive and I, I took five iPhones that I borrowed off various people and I put them in the middle of the table with an elastic band around them and said, do you know those five iPhones have the same external bandwidth to the internet as this entire college? And there was like, what? Well, these are all now 4G, and they've got a consumed con combined bandwidth of about 100 megabits. That's the actual link you have to Janet. And you're trying to put 5,000 students. It's like having 5,000 people upstairs in your son's bedroom all trying to access the Internet whilst you're trying to do your email downstairs. That isn't going to work. So try and get that drama over and say, this isn't about let's do some changes. You're in a mess. You're in a complete stonking mess. Do you know that your firewalls were installed seven years before YouTube was invented? <laughs> you have to get them to really feel that sense of, we need this change. This is, and the questions came at me, how did we get here? Well, we got here because you kept saying no. Every time someone else turned up here and said, we think it would be a good idea to do X, Y, and Z, 
You said no, because we couldn't afford it. Well, now we're in a really bad position. All your switches don't work. Your network infrastructure doesn't work. All of your machines don't work. And there was a shock. It was, how, how did we get here? That transformation needs to be based on something. And the transformation has to be educating people, not just where we are, but in five years' time, students will want, and they'll want X, Y, and Z. So keeping ourselves aware of what's about to happen. That even in my own house, I've got one son and myself and my partner, and somehow we have 15 things attached to the Wi-Fi. I don't know how we got there, but that's what the world's going to look like. And every student's going to have multiple devices. They're going to want them all to work. They're going to want to be able to get to their work from multiple things and multiple places. And the college needs to be aware of that, and the executive needs to be aware of that, and it needs to have a plan in place that does not have me discussing a budget about something that should have been done three years ago. We should be discussing something for a budget in three years' time, and I should be now starting to work on prototyping. Where is my Windows 10 strategy? Where's that? Have I got Windows 10 machines going? Have I got someone working on new servers? Have I built that infrastructure so I can play, learn it and teach my members of staff? We're not talking about a skills gap for today. I have to plan for the skills gap I'm going to have tomorrow if I don't do something today. That's the bit that we're trying to work on. So I think trying to get everybody aware that they need to transform is starting point number one. And that starts with don't think about what's going on today. Think about what's going on tomorrow. Very, very well advised. And we've got a question from the floor. Perhaps more for comment. Um, you said that um, there has to be pain before the change, Somebody before the game. Someone did. <laughs> Came out of your mouth. <laughs> it, was, it was the I question. Well <laughs> that was the question. Um, surely it is the case, and if you go back to the change management textbooks, it's very clearly made the case, that if you properly resource a change, you can achieve a smooth transition change. What universities time and time again fail to do is properly resource change. And my question for the panel is, how do we explain to the senior management of our universities that if they do want change, and IT is forever delivering change and needs to forever deliver change, how do we persuade them that actually they have to properly resource it? And that's people as well as PIN. Okay. Pamela? Well, from my perspective, I very clearly said at the beginning of each financial year's negotiations, okay, give me the budget for capital expenditure, and then we're going to split it into three pots. We're going to put one pot aside for refresh. That is to change out all the old stuff. And we'll not change it out for the same. We'll change it out for something better. But... Put that pot aside. Don't touch it. Leave it to one side. Give it to a completely separate team of people whose job it is to upgrade and refresh and remove all the old stuff and put the new stuff in, number one. Number two, you have to have an innovation fund. There has to be a capital expenditure fund that's there for innovation. If it's not there, you won't innovate. If you don't have a fund where people can turf up with an idea in the middle of the year and say, hey, I've got this great idea, why don't we do this, and you haven't got some seed funding, none of your innovations will ever fly. And thirdly, you have to have that pot which is for your projects and some group of people that looks after the portfolio. If you don't have a portfolio approach to your IT investments and IT projects, they all will fail because each one of them will struggle on its own. You need to keep your eye on the money. Where is the money going? Where is the money coming from? That pot needs to be carefully guarded and wherever there's under spending, spend it on another project before you get to the end of the financial year. We all end up in this financial year nonsense where we try and spend a load of money in the end of July somewhere, don't fall into that trap. Have a portfolio that says somewhere in January this project's struggling, so why don't we just put that on hold and we'll spend the money on this other project. That portfolio approach is very important and keep that together. Keep all your IT projects into one place somewhere. Okay. I, I think I'm now, I'm kind of lost the question looking at something. I'm going to go off and tangent a little bit. I don't think we have a problem. Do you want, do you want the question repeated? Or do you want no, to I'll be tangent. fine. I'll go with it. Um, we, I don't think we have a problem funding change. I think we have a problem funding and support the change. So um, one of the things that um, we're trying to do to feed back to senior managers is kind of relate everything to the benefits, to kind of benefits realisation. So basically say, what is it that you want us to get out of this change? Now some things 
they're not big changes, they're just kind of something's going to happen, so therefore um, it doesn't need as much support for it. But any big changes, um, we, kind of we have to relate it back to what they're trying to achieve. And then actually more and more is to feed back on projects where they don't fund the change necessarily and say, well, look, you know, we have this big project, big rollout, new service, whatever it is, big transformational change. Well, the, here are the benefits we were trying to achieve. Have we actually done that? And nine times out of ten, there'll be a, at least a list of things that haven't, if it hasn't been supported, if training hasn't been put in place, if comms hasn't, hasn't gone out and comms and training, um, if there hasn't been a dialogue with the customer about how it's going to affect them, what they want to do, whether, whether the change is actually going to be something that they want and whether they can pick up on it or whether actually they're quite happy doing something else. Um, if that, all that support hasn't been put in place, then you won't actually get the benefits back that you were envisaging in the first place. In the first place. So I think there's a bit of trial and error, and it's not easy, and we certainly haven't cracked it. Um, but for me, it's about actually knowing what it is that, as an organisation, you want to achieve and relating it back to kind of the organisational strategies. Can I actually bring in Emma here? So, as a student, if um, an area is making a change, so I'll give you an example. So at the University of York, we refurbished our library. And for a time, the library was awful in that there were, you know, big dust sheets and banging and whatever. But at the end, the baby was beautiful. The birth was difficult, but the baby was beautiful. How willing do you think students are to tolerate that if they know? So you've seen your new library come on, haven't you? Are students willing to tolerate some level of disruption if they know it'll be better in the end? Or they just think that? Um, I think as long as you're honest with students, they won't really care. <coughs> I think like the difficulties are if, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. I think the difficulties are if you make big changes and you've not given them prior notice. Like I, I know, especially with the IT department, whenever there's maintenance to be done or anything, they just send us an email probably about a week in advance, say, put like a notice up on the portal saying such and such work will be happening between these hours, the normally hours when no one really needs it anyway, but like no one's really bothered because they've been told. I just think as long as you're honest and you're upfront and you're straightforward with students, they're not really fussy. Um, because at the end of the day, like the service is being bettered for them. So I think just keep it honest and keep it upfront and students don't really mind. Good. That's useful to know. <laughs> Carla, did you have anything else to add? Um, I, was, I suppose I was just going to say I don't think higher education is any different in that respect to anyone else. Um, and I think the conversation for IT for the last few years has been about moving from being a cost to being a business partner. And I think universities, the most successful IT departments in universities are embracing that challenge and actually saying, we're the experts, we know technology, you need technology, have the conversation with us, um, and then we will do our best to provide the services that you want. So I think it's about changing the nature of those very strategic conversations. Okay. Comments, questions from the floor? Oh, oh, wrap your hands. <laughs> Just a quick follow-up to Emma's answer there. Um, if we're trying to get such a notice out, what's the most effective way of doing it? Mm -hmm. Email, Twitter, um, something else we haven't thought of? Um, so, I actually don't really like email that much because I feel like we get bombarded with emails and we get ones of things that might not actually relate to us but might relate it to us last year or whatever so I think sometimes emails if it's not something you can see is directly to you you might not read it I think a uh, portal updates if you have like a, a sort of mini blackboard where people update important notifications and things and um, if you've got an app that would be really good and um, you can just get little notifications on the app to have a check at um, Twitter's obviously great because people check, most people check it as soon as they go, get up in the morning, so that's a really good one to do. Um, and even things that if it's going to be something really vital to say if uh, the virtual learning environment's down for a day, perhaps if you did it in um, a lecture uh, that every department's going to have together, maybe. Um, I think you should definitely try and stay away from emails, though, because I don't always think, if they, even if they do get looked at, I don't know if they get looked at properly. So I think it's better to have it um, in a place where people can look if they want to get updates, because chances are if people aren't looking for the updates, they won't really mind when anything happens anyway. 
Um, but as long as you're putting it somewhere central, easily accessible. Um, so yeah, as you say, Twitter would be great, but if you could put it on something a bit more central, that would be better. Was another question? Just an observation, really. I'd be interested in views on this. Um, I think that universally, in, in change programmes, um, communication comes up as being one of the most important things um, in terms of managing expectations, but also in terms of um, kind of communicating what's in it for me, for the customer. I think that's a, a, a really critical thing. I think that where perhaps sometimes change programmes struggle with this is we might think that we've communicated well up front, but do we communicate along the way? Um, and do we communicate at the end to say it's done um, so that people know that they're at the end of it? Um, kind of interested in views on that. Okay. Views from the panel or views from the floor? Is there any more questions? Sorry, there's a question over there. Mr. Tinson. Troublemaker. I, I'd actually go beyond the tell people when it's done and tell people as things are coming. Um, we've all driven down motorways and seen yeah. services say now fully open. And the reason they're now fully open is that they're now fully open. There's been bits open in between, so the service has been improving as you've gone along. So I, I would sort of endorse that approach to, to sort of drip feed good news. Well, sorry, we'll come back to the panel. Wish all our students were as as Emma. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious to see what your thoughts are. Do you think there's actually a point where there's too much information can come out? Because we got quite heavily stung in adopting a very open, honest policy of we're in a disaster, we have this, we have that, here's our updates. And then when we spoke to students, they said, actually, we don't care. We're just not reading that. We just read the first one. We just want to know it's fixed. And I think we found that quite disheartening because we, we were trying to be engaging. And I'm just curious as to what you think is a reasonable level of engagement in that type of thing from a student perspective. Um, so I think... What I see is vital information from IT, so if the virtual learning environment's down, if emails are down, if timetables are down, anything like that, I think they obviously need to know ASAP. Um, but then things with IT updates, I think you should probably have somewhere. Um, I'm not sure how your website might work, but we've got an IT and library services tab. Perhaps if you had a sort of like running feed on there, so people who are interested, and there will be a lot of people who are interested, but just because they don't email you and tell you that they're interested doesn't mean that they aren't. So I'd say maybe if you didn't want to just, if you were you emailing it to all the students or... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think you need to sort of try and get the best of both worlds in the sense that you shouldn't stop telling people because if people are asking for that information, and I'm sure some people are really interested in that information, but perhaps like when you're emailing them, just honestly, students get enough emails. So I don't think that's useful anyway because if people are complaining about them, um, it means, again, it probably means they're not reading them. Um, and social media, I think that should again be more for like important updates. Twitter's meant to be you know, quick, succinct, so maybe we're starting work, we're midway through work, we've just finished the work. But if you had a stream, sort of, you could update it daily or every couple of days, just saying these are the updates we've got, like this is the end goal. Um, so then it's still accessible for people who are really interested, um, but at the same time, you're not going to get the mooners. There's always mooners. <laughs> Okay, so I wanted to come back to the panel on this question of, of communication. Um, any thoughts on that around projects, communication happening? Yeah, uh, well, it's an interesting one because we um, refurbed our website about 
18 months ago, we had a huge project that took about a year about the universities going through a big series of web transformation. And we, as part of this, we went out, we wanted to know what students and staff wanted from an IT services website. Um, so we had loads and loads of focus groups, and I kept saying, don't you want to know about all the great things we're going to do for you? <coughs> we used to have this huge in project site that had told everybody about all the projects we were doing. And actually staff said, no, we don't. We'll never look at it. Well, we only want to know about stuff that's coming up, when it's going to affect us, when it's going to happen. Fine, give us a kind of a bit of a sales pitch about where we're going and the strategy and the overall kind of direction of things, but don't keep bombarding us with information about stuff that is going to happen that isn't here yet or is going to happen in six months because we won't keep coming back to it. Uh, now, interestingly, we've had this website live for about a year and we're already talking about, well, maybe we need to introduce a bit about the project, maybe it needs to come back a little bit. Um, and we are getting questions from people now that it's not there, saying, well, what are you doing? <laughs> so you can't <coughs> win, I think, to some extent. Um, but it, it kind of depends, to me, on what the impact is on the people. So for, for outages, all that sort of thing, we do all the things that Em was talking about. So actually, we kind of try and put it out in lots of different ways. It's on the portal, it's on the Twitter, it's on our website. Um, people get an RSS feed, all that kind of good stuff about outages and things that are coming up. And that does include, well, next week we're doing this. And then as it gets closer, it's always there. But it's, um, it's not emailed out to people. Um, I think there is... I think we're not very good at the when it's finished point. I think that's completely right. We, we finish things and we're not very good at kind of shouting out about what the benefits are necessarily or hey, how great it is or what this difference is going to make to particular individuals. Um, so we just kind of go, oh, phew, that's there now. <laughs> and we just expect people to use it. So there, there, there is certainly an element of the... Of the uh, you can't ever get comms completely right, is, or however much you do is, um, is, is my lesson at the moment. But, but definitely talking to people and thinking about the impact that things have on them and when it's going to affect them is the big thing that we're kind of trying to do now. <laughs> is, um, I guess it's trying to personalise it a little bit more. John? Um, I think um, there's different communication levels for different groups, obviously. Um, within the IT organisation, the IT services organisation has a completely open communication front. There is nothing that is hidden. There are no secret projects. There's constantly a DevOps type approach in, in an agile DevOps world. It's daily communication. It's not weekly communication or monthly, and everybody's constantly aware of where everything's up to. But in that kind of traditional Apple way, we don't tell anybody who doesn't need to know until we're really close to delivering it. Because if we do that, then they start to get too much into the kind of where is it, why is it late, and we don't have any flexibility when it comes to time. If you start pinning too much of the things in the projects that you do to a specific time, then the pressure to deliver to that time ends up with people cutting corners to meet the time. I'd rather not tell people the time until I'm actually pretty sure I can do it. And then I'll say it's nearly delivered. So six weeks before we rolled out all our Xerox printers, after a year and a half of working through tendering and negotiation and discussions and back-ends and following printing and everything else, we finally started putting posters up. And suddenly there was posters everywhere. We're getting a new set of printers. They're coming in six weeks' time. This is what you have to do. And the printers started rolling out. I already knew they were in a warehouse in Amsterdam ready to roll, so I was kind of confident that we were about to go live. And I'm happy that I can therefore say this project is about to happen because I need people to know that it's coming so they make some changes. But for the rest of the time, I keep it internally, but open internally. Everybody who needs to know is involved. Even down to the users who come into our building to do the testing. They're fully engaged, they're fully involved, they have daily input, daily output, they understand what's going on. But even they go back to their teams and they say, oh yeah, it's coming along very nicely. And eventually, when we are really ready to go live, <coughs> everybody gets the benefit. Nobody gets that kind of, why the hell is it taking this long? And I think that actually gives people a good sense of what's happening. <coughs> they have a feeling that tomorrow something else good could happen. It's not just waiting for something in three years' time. Constantly waiting for years to get things in. Great, thank you. Comments on that? Questions? Anecdotes? No? Right, so, next question. This is... Or Emma. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm on um, 
What's it called? Blind date? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, this question is not like that. <laughs> right, it says here, have you found that technology and IT services have changed rapidly during your time at university? <coughs> you chose that you have. But then it says, and how well do you think students respond to technology changes? And I think what they're meaning here is, do you want things to change quickly? Um, yes, I think everything has changed really rapidly at university. And yes, I think that's what people want. Um, I know a few people have talked about how difficult it can be to implement change, but I don't really feel like that's the way the students are taught of. Um, everyone just seems to be more and more willing to, whenever we get new computers, like, people are really pleased, like they want to use those computer rooms more. Um, whenever there's app updates, people want to update their apps. Uh, the new email, straight away people were updating that and putting the apps on their phone for the new email. I don't think there's ever going to be a technology change that people aren't going to want. In fact, I remember my first year when we were getting surveys about apps. It was just as iPhones were getting quite big and they were saying, what are the sort of things you'd want to include on your app? What are the sort of things um, you think are a bit pointless? So right from the out, it was all about how you can evolve the technology to suit students better. And I think that's the good thing about universities. As long as they're keeping students' needs central, students will always use the technology. And as long as they always use the technology, the IT service departments will be successful. It's just when you're taking out um, things that students are telling you and putting in things that they might need. Um, because a lot of the time, like, you wouldn't want an app which has got 24 different features if you're only going to use six of them. So it's much better to be succinct and go along with what students are recommending. Any comments or questions on that one? Yes? Somebody at the back there? So, who should be the driver for change? So, we're a lot of very intelligent people here. <laughs> <laughs> we know what our customers want. There's John's example earlier of the firewall that was out of date. We're telling our customers that the firewall's out of date. We might tell Emma that you do need these 24 functions, should we actually tell our customers what they want or should we go out and ask them what they want? Um, I would say meet in the middle to some extent. Obviously, you'll know a lot more about how things run better, but I'll know more about how people function, like day-to-day, -day, like where their needs would be. Um, and how much of the stuff they have got on their apps and other facilities. Because a lot of the time, if you're trying to condense too much information into something, it just puts people off using an app or a website or things like that. Just because if it's going to be daunting or it's going to be too difficult and it would be easier if you just like, went, on, went through a normal website. So I think you still need to offer things because you've obviously got a more information and you obviously know how things run better but you still got to think about the people who are using it at the end of the day because even if you know how something runs better if they're not going to use it as well then it becomes a bit pointless okay so i could put this one back to the panel as well because i think it's a very interesting question about who should drive change so if you i don't know if anybody's ever read the book steve jobs uh, biography one of the things he says in there is he did no market research around the apple iphone or ipad he thought it was a really good idea. Nobody had asked him for it. He just decided it was a good thing to do. Um, and Ford famously said, didn't he, if you ask people what they wanted, they'd say they wanted faster horses. They wouldn't have said they wanted a car. So it is a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. Who should decide? You know, how do you get this balance right about what to do, what changes to make? So with that little time bomb for the panel, who wants to answer that? Um, I think, first of all, um, I spend half my life um, talking to members of the IT services team about gadgets, technologies, stuff that's coming up, stuff that we might use, stuff that we might not use. Um, VMware recently announced a Horizon View client for a Chromebook. So suddenly Chromebooks can now look at virtual desktops and it's like, right, I'm going to get one of these and take it out. I started throwing it around and showing it to people and everything else. Um, that kind of gives people the, the, the feeling that there's other things there, that there's other technologies, there's other ways of doing things. And that generates interest and in what could we do, what might we do. So trying to get people to raise their sights from just, I need this to be faster, 
I want a faster horse, hit the, I want a better whip. <laughs> that doesn't always work. Um, that's good. And then listening is important. So, okay, how do I listen? So I spend a lot of time in my um, teacher's group. So there's a, a champion's group for the ILT. So um, we have lots of people who are interested in IT from each department. They come together. There's a champion's group. We sit down. We talk about how technology could be used in their various departments. I go and sit on the um, student unions groups. They have um, every site has its own campus team for the students. So I go and sit on those and I listen to what they're talking about and trying to listen to those voices. As I said in the presentation yesterday, listening to the voices of all the different component parts is important. Um, an old boss of mine said, I spend 50% of my time listening because I have to listen to a lot of people telling me a lot of things. Then 50% of the time trying to tell them what they've just told me. So it's always that kind of, I listen and I listen a lot and I listen to what the industry is doing in order to then be able to say, as Steve Jobs would, I now have a really good idea of what I think we should do. But without that leadership, I don't think we go anywhere. You have to have a, a confidence that, okay, I've got it. I now know what everybody wants. And you have to, with confidence, step forward. Because if you don't, you'll not go anywhere. You'll just keep going, what? And compete and everything else. And in, it seems ironic, but the traditional agile approach, <laughs> traditional, doesn't seem that long since it was born, but having a product backlog that says these are all the ideas that everybody wants and then keep ticking off the ones that are the most popular at the time, that works. <coughs> Giving everybody those little bits of change on a regular basis so they get the feeling that everything's moving forward in their particular <coughs> service, their particular software, whatever it is, that helps as well. So try and keep your agile stuff going, keep your eye on the future and listen to everybody what they say and what they want. Great, thank you. Rachel? Yeah, I think we've had some challenges recently about actually making time to be able to juggle the little bits that need doing. So the feedback we get from students about that, it would be great if we just did this with the big projects that we've got going on. So actually having that space to be able to do um, the quick things um, is really important. I think the other thing to know, I've just noted down here, is actually provide opportunities for sharing practice. Because it's not just about the IT services that we provide anymore. I mean, uh, how many, we don't provide Skype at the moment, we might be too, but, um, <laughs> but um, people use technology that's just out there all the time these days and actually finding really cool things that are out there and how they can be used in education is really important, whether it be for kind of more traditional professional services services or whether it be for teaching and learning. Um, so we're trying to have kind of more and more sessions for sharing best practice, but that, that in itself takes time because people need time to get together. So um, but that's, that's one thing that we're trying to do at the moment. Carla? I think that's a great point that's just been made there. I think that's fantastic. You know, everybody is using technology. Uh, you're all very clever people. And we, we tend to just look, without in our little silo way, at what the institution is doing. And I think there's much more to be gained with technology these days by cherry-picking things that fit and linking people up to technology uh, based on their needs, based on the conversations that we're having with, with our actual customers. Questions or comments from the floor? Yep, somebody at the back. Hi. Uh, just picking up what Rachel was just saying um, about seeing all the other things that are out there and, and sort of trying to stay innovative. How do you balance staying innovative but also making sure you're making the right choices um, for all the new technologies and services that are out there that stick and become the next Facebook and the next Twitter? There are hundreds more that fizzle out. Um, and with the, the, the way that we kind of address change, choosing something that's going to stick and knowing that it's going to stick is going to be very difficult when we might say, oh, this is the next big thing, and then a few months later, no one's using it and everyone's moved on. How do we make those right choices? My first answer is I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I think, I think the thing is, for me, it's not about, um, it's about enabling people to use the tools that they want to use more than saying, okay, this is now going to become an institutional thing that we're going to use and making people recognize. Um, one example I've got is um, one of my teams started using Trello when it first, very first came out. And I was going, oh, we don't want to put all our project plans into Trello because, you know, it might go down next week and then you've lost everything and you've got backups of this. Are you keeping it all in something else? Um, 
you know, it's still with us and loads of people are using it now. So, um, but it wasn't about taking that and saying that's, in, it's about, um, oh God, what's the time? It's about making them aware of the risks that they're taking and using those technologies as well. So, you know, if they put all their eggs into one basket and it disappears tomorrow. So it's kind of almost going back to the kind of point that was made about digital capabilities. It's making people aware of the world that we're living in and the dangers and the benefits of using really cool stuff that's out there, um, rather than it being about this is now our institutional way of doing stuff, which we still need and is still very valuable, but there are kind of bits on the edge that, especially in the teaching and learning, you're, in, you're not going to be able to control it anymore anyway, so kind of why try? Very good. Any more questions? Right, I'm going to wrap up then. So it said in the brief, three or four minutes at the beginning and three or four minutes at the end. <laughs> so I'm wondering how to summarise that discussion that we've just had. <laughs> I've just been thinking about that. So the things that have stood out for me are change is just what happens. And really, I think that we should stop even labelling it. It's just part of what happens. This grasping of, I'd like it to be as it always was, it's never been like that, and it never will be. So maybe we should just let go of that idea. Um, really like the ideas and discussions around communication of change. So this idea of telling people that you are going to do something, but maybe not very far ahead of when it's actually going to happen. And then making absolutely clear that people are aware that you've finished it, and that what you've done has brought them benefit. Because I think you're exactly right. We do loads of things that are really cracking and we never, once we've done them, they're almost, you know, oh yeah, we've done that. Um, so this piece around benefits realisation, selling what we've done to people. And then this one around communication keeps coming back. I think there's also an acceptance of the fact <coughs> that you are never going to get it right. You will always get some people moaning at you, whatever you do. And I was struck by a fact that um, I'm sure that you all do staff surveys in your organisations which are benchmarked against other organisations sometimes inside HE, sometimes outside in every single staff survey ever done communication is seen as a problem in every organisation, no matter what it is so it just shows you that it's one of those things that's very difficult to get right particularly around change, I think it's very difficult to get right and then the last thing is what we've been hearing is this idea of being open to innovations and supporting people and I think that one of the things IT departments are getting much better at now is, but is being more mellow and saying, we cannot control all of this. Let's open our minds, embrace it, support people to use these tools. And also, I think you've got a session happening in here a little bit later on. Sometimes it won't work. And accept that failing, is it fail fast, fail often or something? Mm -hmm. the name of the next uh, session. Accept that when you're doing some of these things, they're not going to work. Um, and accept that as not being a catastrophe but as something that you can learn from. Thank you very much for your participation and uh, coffee now I think. <laughs> <laughs>